Now it's a pleasure and honor to introduce my dear friend and elegant speaker, Professor Sameh Amin from Military Academy, who will talk to us about hypertension and AF. Professor Sameh. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Taban Bashkur Gamayat al Dacht, says Dr. Mohsen Ibrahim, says Dr. Suleiman Gharib, Dr. Omar, and Dr. Wafa, Ala Dawiti, and Taban al Munazimin, and Dr. Salim, and Tim Tamahad al Alb. كل تشيرمان معهد القلب هم كلهم قاعدين يعني. <تصفيق> My topic will be about hypertension and atrial fibrillation. This is my agenda. Hypertension is one of the most prevalent cardiovascular disorders in clinical practice. Globally, the disease affects up to 50% of adults and the numbers of patients are constantly growing. Hypertension control rates are poor globally with the studies suggesting as few as one in five have blood pressure control despite knowing they have hypertension. While atrial fibrillation presents a considerable public health burden and is the most common type of arrhythmia affecting around one to 2% of the general population, increasing to around 10% of persons by the age of 80. AF contributes to the significantly increased risk of a stroke from embolic events or heart failure resulting in greater all-cause mortality. And hypertension comes is the most common independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation worldwide. Uh, hypertensive patients have a 50% increase in the relative risk of developing atrial fibrillation compared to persons without hypertension. And there was a 19% increase in the relative risk of atrial fibrillation per 20 millimeter mercury increase in the systolic blood pressure and 6% increase in the relative risk by 10 millimeter mercury increase in the diastolic blood pressure. However, there was an increased risk even within what is considered the normal blood pressure range. As we can appreciate from this figure that the instance of developing AF increases with a systolic blood pressure, if it increases from 100 to 140, the relative risk increases from 1 to 1.5, and it also applies for the same with the diastolic pressure increase from 60 to 80, the risk of developing uh, atrial fibrillation increases as published in 2023. And these are the percentage of or the prevalence of hypertension in AF trials as published in 2012. And we can appreciate from this figure in many trials that the prevalence ranges between 50 to more than 80% in most of the AF trials. In a more recent publication, 2019, the prevalence of hypertension in uh, the hypertension in AF trials from 60 to 80%, while in the NOAX trials uh, for the non-valvular atrial fibrillation, the four famous trials that, that rely, the, the prevalence of hypertension is around 79%, the Rocket AF 90%, the Aristotle is 87%, and the Engage AF TIMI 48 is more than 93%. <laughs> Hypertension and AF have an intimate relationship. They both affect males more than females, both increase the prevalence with age. And the raised blood pressure is a well-established risk factor, not only for new onset AF, but also for AF maintenance and progression. And both hypertension and atrial fibrillation are associated with an increased incidence of stroke, heart failure, and mortality. This uh, paper published 2015 summarizes some clinical links between the AF and the hypertension, and they stated that hypertension is the most common cardiovascular comorbidity among patients with AF. Hypertension leads to electrical and structural alteration to the left atrium that predisposes to atrial fibrillation. Both hypertension and atrial fibrillation are associated with autonomic dysfunction, and renin angiotensin aldosterone system upregulation. Also, hypertension is a potent risk factor for stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation and is a potent risk factor for bleeding among patients with AF who are treated with anticoagulants. <laughs> 
So what's the mechanism of AF in uh, atrial fibrillation? There are some structural remodeling process that occurs in the left atrium that begins relatively quickly after the onset of hypertension. Considering the frequent lack of symptoms of high blood pressure, it may cause organ damage leading to inflammatory changes, fibrosis, and atrial hypertrophy even before the diagnosis. And that left ventricular hypertrophy with coexisting increase in the left ventricular stiffness lead to an increased left atrial pressure, which is a mechanism for atrial fibrillation. Also, autonomic nervous system dysregulation are reconsidered as another contributor in AF development. And this figure published in the Journal of Human Hypertension 2019 summarizes the potential mechanisms of uh, AF in hypertension, where hypertension produces some hemodynamic changes that will reduce the LV diastolic and systolic function and increase the left atrial pressure, so it's a direct cause of atrial fibrillation. Also, some autonomic dysregulation due to hypertension may lead to atrial fibrillation. On the other side, the atrial uh, arterial stiffness, the left ventricular hypertrophy, with the RAS activation leads to diffuse fibrosis and inflammation, which leads to structural remodeling in the left atrial uh, and increase in the left atrial size that leads to atrial fibrillation. Now, how to prevent the, pro, the, pro, the AF in the hypertension patient. There is some implication of the low blood pressure targets in AF, and that pathophysiologically lower blood pressure results in less strain on the LV, and thus more aggressive blood pressure control may have benefits in the terms of LV hypertrophy, myocardial fibrosis, diastolic dysfunction, and retrograde atrial stretching and structural remodeling. This atrial stretching and structural remodeling serves as a substrate for AF development and persistence. So better blood pressure control improved the survival in AF patient. And this was a study published in Circulation Research 2018. It compared the tight blood pressure control with the usual control in the instance of new onset AF in those patients. And as we can appreciate in the figure that the tight control showed less, less incidence of atrial fibrillation compared to usual control. Also, there uh, have been shown a J-shaped relationship between the blood pressure value and the incident AF among individuals who were receiving antihypertensive treatment and as we can appreciate that the optimal blood pressure to have a less incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation is the systolic between 120 and 130, while the diastolic between 65 and 75 is the optimal to have a less incidence of atrial fibrillation in hypertensive patients, while figures below or above these figures increase the incidence of AF. Also in this paper, in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction below 40, the optimal blood pressure between systolic between 120 and 40 showed the uh, less the less uh, proportion of time spent in AF and also freedom from recurrent AF, while higher or lower uh, values showed more incidence of AF. In this recent trial, which is a Mendelian randomization trial. Uh, comparing the, uh, it's talking about the relation between blood pressure and risk of atrial fibrillation. They concluded that the relationship between blood pressure and risk of AF may be causal, suggesting that strict control of blood pressure might represent a long-term effective strategy to reduce the burden of, of AF in those patients. So the guidelines of hypertension 2023 as a class one recommendation for the prevention of AF in hypertension, they recommended that a workup for hypertension is recommended in patients at risk for AF, such as those with high normal blood pressure, left ventricular hypertrophy, and left atrial dilatation. Also, antihypertensive treatment is recommended to reduce the risk of incident and recurrent AF, and it is also a class one recommendation. While for patients with AF and hypertension, treatment of hypertension reduces the risk of a stroke and other cardiovascular outcomes in patients with atrial fibrillation, and it is also a class one recommendation. Finally, how to treat 
hypertension in an EF patient. This also was uh, summarized with some uh, clinical implications or therapeutic implications in the association between atrial fibrillation and hypertension. That hypertension should be considered in calculating the stroke and the bleeding risks in patients with atrial fibrillation. That's the chad vask score and the has blood score. Also, uh, hypertension remains a therapeutic target of promise in the prevention of atrial fibrillation. The use of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker is evidence-based in patients with atrial fibrillation and left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And that randomized trials suggest that RAS blockers may have a class-specific benefit in preventing atrial fibrillation, while beta blockers are evidence-based treatment for the rate control in atrial fibrillation and are also useful in the treatment of concomitant hypertension. This was a Korean study uh, on a large number of patients, around 3,100 Korean uh, adults, with oral anticoagulant naïve. Uh, non-valvular AF, and they showed the control blood, uh, blood pressure control about the prevention of these major uh, adverse events. So uh, optimal blood pressure with a systolic between 120 and 30 and a diastolic less than 80 reduced the major cardiovascular events, the death from all causes, ischemic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, and also myocardial infarction and heart failure admission. And the conclusion of this trial is that the systolic of 120 to 129 and the diastolic below 80 millimeter mercury was the optimal blood pressure treatment target for patients with AF under hypertension treatment. These are some statements on the, from the uh, recent uh, European guidelines 2023 on hypertension and for the management of patients with hypertension and AF. First, that all major antihypertensive drug classes favor left ventricular hypertrophy regression. Beta blockers may have been preferentially used in hypertensive patients with AF. ACE, ARBs, CCBs are more effective on LVH regression than beta blockers and diuretics with encouraging results for, for ACE and ARBs in the preventing AF in patients with LV dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy, or dilated left atrium. ARBs are also more effective than CCBs in preventing AF in patients with high-risk hypertension. There is a role for mineral corticoid receptor antagonists that may decrease the new onset AF in patients with half ref or half path also, the SGL2 inhibitors is associated with a significant decrease in the risk of incident AF in patients with or without diabetes. And this is the algorithm that was uh, uh, published in the European Guidelines 2023 in the management of hypertension and AF. And it's based on the uh, heart rate from the start. If the heart rate is above 80, we can use ACE or ARBs plus beta blockers as step one in a dual combination, while if the heart rate is below 80, the uh, ACE or ARBs plus a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or a cyathide or cyazide like diuretic is the first step. The second step is to go to triple therapy and the third step is for the quadruple therapy. This is my last slide. It's about the management of patients with hypertension and F during oral anticoagulation. And the guidelines give us a class one recommendation that initiation of oral anticoagulation should ideally start if the systolic blood pressure is below 160. But if it is above 160, it is recommended in priority to reduce the blood pressure, to reduce the risk of major bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage. And also a class one recommendation is that the same treatment targets and the same choice of agents are recommended as for the general population in patients with hypertension and AF. Uh, class three is that the non-hydropyridine calcium channel blockers, the deltiazem and verapamil for rate control should be used with cautious because they may interfere with oral anticoagulation and increased risk of bleeding. And thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Samah, for very elegant and concluded about the AF in hypertension. I just want to know your opinion and the panelists also opinion about using the SGL2 in non-diabetic because as you, you said that it may decrease the incidence of AF. Hmm. What's your opinion if you have a just hypertensive patient with LVH and uh, if do you think if giving SGL2 giving him it may benefit or it is it's out uh, the right I think lines? as mentioned by Professor Omar Awad in the previous uh, lecture that SGL2 is the class one recommendation for the half PEF patients, which is uh, most of them are hypertensive patients. So the, uh, from this point, the, the management of high PEF patients with hypertension with the SGL2, which is the only class one recommended drug for the management of this entity, I think maybe the reduction in the half PEF itself and the control of blood pressure will reduce the incidence of F. Thank you. ألف شكر سامح شكرا جزيلا